Right, a very warm welcome back. Uh, we're in Woodmead today for the latest in the series of uh, New Age business briefings. And today we're looking at uh, gender-based violence uh, against uh, women and also the abuse of children. And sadly, uh, the main perpetrators are men. And, uh, you know, often we think that it's, uh, it's the, the people that are mired in poverty, but it's right across the board. Rich, intelligent people, men, uh, are doing the same thing. So it is a scourge right across all strata of society. And we're just trying to unpack what we can do, how we can contribute, uh, because I guess uh, often you, you, you hear um, the greatest tragedy is being silent when you see something that's bad happening and we do nothing. So let's continue to unpack this. We're going to start getting your questions uh, as well as uh, the audience here. Uh, hashtag TNA Biz Brief at Morning Live SABCs where we'll pick up uh, your questions. Uh, but just before the break, I did raise an issue about gender equality and the private sector not empowering our women, A, not employing them in the same degree as men, and paying them in the same degree as men, I'm sure contributes to this problem that we have. Mr. Shozi? Definitely, the, the question is bigger. It's about participation of women in the economy and the owning of businesses. And it's also, that is also fueled by issues of where we come from as a country. Because when you look at the employment equity reports, you could really see that race is also a, a factor there. We will find that white women are faring better than black and, and, and colored women and Indian women. Therefore, it's important. Where we we'll find women as well, we'll find them in the, in the sectors which I will term the soft sectors, mm -hmm. uh, in the high engineering. And I think as a country, we need to do a lot on that. And the issue of the wage gap is one of the critical issues as well in these sectors. And therefore, it's something that all of us in partnership, we must also fight. We must also scrutinize these companies as well. And in this day and age in South Africa, we'll be surprised that in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, there are about 53 companies in terms of the census report who don't even have a single woman in their board. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we could really see that the, the, the problem is bigger. The part target I spoke about earlier on is something that you need to actually fight. But mm -hmm. it's also important for women when they see these things, because I know there's fear as well when you work that you're going to lose your job and so on, to report this to the relevant authorities like the Gender Commission, the Women's mm -hmm. Ministry, so that we are able to investigate these things. We bring these companies to the book as different institutions so that these things, they actually stop from happening. It's very, very critical. And those things, those are, those are covered gender discrimination that is not always what, easy what, to see. What do we say to the man who says, I can't marry a woman who earns more than me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the issue of love is a choice issue. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 but also, we must also educate our men as well. To, to appreciate women who are doing well and support them, you know? And I think that narrative for gender equality is important because it also swears the stereotype that as a man you must support your wife, your children, and so on. As men must also know that we can't be supported by our spouses. And I think we must also agree as men to say, now times have changed and our, our, our husbands, our, our, our husbands, our, our, our wives as well could earn more than us, and therefore it's important for us to support that. But I think it's, it's around the issue of gender for men to actually mm -hmm. understand that. But we cannot really force them to actually do that. It's a, letter, it's a matter of an education that needs to go around the country for men to actually accept this. Someday, even more, when, when a woman marries, they will even say, please stop working because now we have yes, made it. Yes. And those are some of the things that we must also challenge as a country to say, we, ha we, we are a, a free South Africa, yeah. women and men must be free. Minister, do you want to add to that? Because the, the other side of the equation is that a, a women get intimidated when they are in powerful positions and they feel scared that they might be too intimidating if they're powerful. Well, my experience is that um, there are no women who are scared of power. Women, when they're given an opportunity, in fact, they work double they always make sure that they become successful. I think that's the message for me or my experience to say, women in power continue to do that, but at the same time, we still have challenges as a country or globally. Some of the issues which retain women 
in middle management is the environment. It's not that they want that. So it's some of the issues which we've got to address that uh, there's nothing wrong in being a, 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 a married person or being a family woman and be a professional woman. Mm. That's what we've got to deal with. Yeah. Because it's the competing issues which mm. makes sometimes women not to move up because they've got to make choices. Mm. I think we, can't, we can no longer allow that to happen where women can make choices. They want to be professional. If you become professional, mm. you can be a family person. These must go together. Because men don't make choices, by the mm. way. When they decide to be family men, they become family men and professionals at the mm. same time. Mm. So this needs to go together, sure. and that's part of education. And it also means the salient laws which don't address the empowerment of women and recognize that women can have children and be professionals must be addressed. Okay. All right, let's start going to our tables and uh, looking at Twitter as well as we uh, go to table number two where we'll find um, uh, Fadoz Bobulia who's got a question there about the media. Okay, table number two. Uh, thank you. Do I stand? Yes, yes, so the camera okay. can pick you up. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Minister. Thank you for your presence and the important information that you share. As um, a media professional, my concern is always how women are portrayed in the media and what kind of training and skills upliftment do we have in order to ensure that we help women, particularly as we look as we're moving towards the local elections and we know the kind of spec that's going to start. Um, I also want to know whether women are trained and equipped for social media. I think these are the issues that we need to raise. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I, I think we have a challenge generally in the media space. Not only in South Africa, it's a global problem which we have to address. How women are perceived, but also how media continues mm. to undermine women. Even successful women are always being bashed by the media. And you know, I remember some old times ago, uh, when I was still very energetic and young, we were... <laughs> <laughs> You're still young. <laughs> One of our approach and the challenges were about the media itself. And I think we need to go back to those issues in raising them because indeed, it does play in the space of destroying women. But I would also say for us as women, we need to stand up address those issues instead of leaving the women in media to be on their own. Let's mobilize them, bring them on board, but also raise issues where our own women in the media are being used to bash other women. We've got to change that. We've got to change those attitudes uh, because they continue to perpetuate patriarchy, but also they continue to perpetuate powers for others. So for me, it's very important. If you look at the media, for instance, it's not different from other uh, uh, industries. How many women are in top leadership of the media? Mm. Very, very few, precisely because of the same issues, the attitudes, the environment, it's hostile. Mm. You know, if you're a woman in the media, you know that sometimes you'll not be able to go out for a story at night. Therefore, you are not a better woman. So for you to be a better woman in the media, you must be this go-getter, mm -hmm. even situations which are very difficult. So those are some of the issues which we've got to address. Mm -hmm. How do we make it conducive for women in the media to do their work and compete fairly mm -hmm. without themselves mm -hmm. pretending or behaving like men? Okay, Mr. Shazi. No, there is a perception created that the scorecard used by the media to score women is higher than the one they used to score men. And, and I think it's critical, and the, man has to, the woman has to actually double up mm -hmm. for, for, for her to actually be equal to me. And I think that's, that's, that's critical, and I, and I think the media must also be fair to women and how rep, they represent them mm -hmm. in the public as well. So mm -hmm. that, that is important, and there's, there's that narrative within the gender mm -hmm. uh, uh, discourse around those particular issues, which the media needs to actually in, in do an instruction in introspection on themselves on those particular issues mm. so that we are able to actually uh, measure women uh, alongside men in an equal footing. Um, a colleague uh, in the media, uh, Justice Malala, said something last week that really hit home for me. Uh, he said, you know, if 
women were beating up men at the same rate that men are doing it, there would be outrage <laughs> at this. And I'm just wondering why there isn't that outrage when a woman is being beaten. You know, um, it's precisely because of the patriarchy. If, if you look at, I mean, coming to that point, I was reflecting on my own. There are so many campaigns which go on in this country, which men support. They even put resources. But in this campaign, how many men have come forward mm. to pledge themselves? Mm. Huge or big men, popular, famous, mm. Mm. call them. Mm. Why are they not supporting this? It's precisely because of the patriarchal society, but it's also because it hurts. Mm -hmm. It's so close to their comfort. Mm -hmm. They are unable to deal with it. And that's what we've got to challenge. And as the ministry, we're going to continue challenging them, even in high offices, for them to come forward and pledge themselves in changing their attitudes. Mm -hmm. It can't just be about those ordinary people. And I'm happy that you're raising the issue. If, if us women were going to beat them, uh, yeah. it will be a big issue. It would be. Unfortunately, <laughs> we're not going to do it because we don't want it. Yeah. We want to create a society which cares, but a society yeah. which is non-violent. That is why we're here yeah. today. But I'm saying we want to call on every man in this country to raise a voice and participate. Don't make noise in platforms, mm. but in your own house, mm. in your own home, you are a monster, because it's not going to help us. Mr. Shazi. No, I, agree, I agree with that statement. Look at the, the campaign around people wanting rain to fall. Mm. If you can use the same momentum. Mm. Mm. And I think we can actually um, uh, rescue and eradicate gender-based violence. And, and I think we are not putting our resources together. Everyone at home will know that I have to save what, I have to do this. If we can use that, that particular momentum, and I think we can eradicate okay. to say in our homes as well, we are able to actually uh, deal with some of these issues. All right. I'm going to start asking for solutions. If I hear somebody being beaten next door and everybody knows it's happening, what do we do? I need some answers to that. Nicolene de Klerk is on table number one. Nicolene de Klerk, table number one. Uh, there's a microphone there. There we go. Good morning, Minister, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, the one thing that we come across on a daily basis is the, the, the woman always asks, why, does, why do we as the um, victims have to leave mm. our home with our children to go and find uh, protection yep. in shelters, why not remove the perpetrator mm. and send him to a, a shelter where they can, he can go for counselling and come back when he's ready to deal with his family in the right way. Thank you. Okay. I think that's a very, very important question. Um, I was with a one of the UN partners, uh, and the same question arose, because globally, it's about removing the woman, um, and then the person remains. It's some of the issues I think, I think we've got to challenge head on. It also goes to the laws, because the issue of uh, being married in community of property, all those issues, it's us who make the laws as people, but it's also us who must change the laws when they're not amenable. And I think that's a valid point. In South Africa, for instance, it's not uh, about the, 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 you as a woman moving out. It's also about the children. We, because where we are, our system is not adequate enough to remove you with your children. We've got to address that. And that is why we see sometimes the, the woman gets a protection order, you leave your kids, the person becomes a monster, slaughter all your children. So we need to bring a balance in making sure that as we review what we have done, mm. we improve on it in incorporating the women. And definitely, we need a discussion in saying who goes out of the house. Right. Is it you with the kids? Or is this individual who can go out with a suitcase 
and find a place, an alternative place, than removing the whole family. You disorganize the children, their school, and everything. So those are some of the things I think we have to debate how best we make sure that we protect the family. I'm going to read a tweet, which I know is going to be provocative, but I think it speaks to the kind of attitude that a lot of people have out there. Um, Duduzi says, um, what about those women who keep on posting their half-naked pictures on Twitter and Facebook? How do we respect them? L let me say, I'm not sure whether it's the same Duduzi uh, or it's a different one. Mm. It might be a coincidence that people who make such comments are to do this. There was a, <laughs> there was a to do this again who again yeah. was saying a very very negative uh, uh, message or such comment mm. about women. There's nothing wrong in when I decide to display my body. We see men with their six packs. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. And we, we, we admire them because for us, they are reflecting health, wellness, and also encouraging other young people to say, look good. So there's nothing wrong when women display good bodies, encouraging other young, young women to say, look good and look healthy. It's, mm. There's no message at all. Mm. It's about saying, look at me, I am this woman or young, and confident to show my body as a healthy person. It's all about that. It can't be men okay. only. So I'm saying there's nothing wrong <laughs> in seeing Maps Maponyana's six pack. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> nothing wrong, nothing wrong. So why should it be wrong when a young woman displays a beautiful body to show, because it's about health mm. and wellness, okay. which we're trying to promote no, as a country. Easy. I think the issue of exposing bodies is, an, is a Western issue, because in Africa, people were exposing their own bodies, yeah. Yeah. culturally. And um, I don't think that uh, we, we could, and I think in terms of the constitution as well, uh, we are allowed to actually do that. Mm. And, and, and I agree with the minister wholly on that. But I think, I'm not sure where that thing is coming from, saying we must cover our bodies, because yeah. traditionally we're not covering our bodies. Okay, but again, I've got to keep coming back to the message that women are sending as well, because just last week, I think it was, the First Lady of Zimbabwe, um, Mrs. Grace Mugabe, said to women, do not be surprised if you get raped if you wear mini skirts. And for somebody that level, such a senior person in society, that kind of message can't be helpful. Hmm. It, it, you know, I, I, I was not around, I didn't hear that. Mm. That's a sad statement, which cannot be accepted, said by a woman. And I also want to say, we also need to understand the issue of socialization and training becomes very important. It doesn't mean that those at the top are socially liberated. They understand some of them are so oppressed. They need to be liberated. Mm -hmm. So it's a reflection of a woman because of the position she's occupying, mm -hmm. who think that is liberated, but not. So I'm happy that uh, you know in South Africa we have our first ladies who participate in advocacy, awareness programs, in making sure that they change the stereotypes. We're very fortunate to have such first ladies who are conscious, who don't go about blaming women uh, for inviting such horrible thing. No woman can invite rape because it destroys you, it kills you, your spirit psychologically it affects you. So it can't be right mm. for a woman to such a thing. We need to condemn it, but also we need to educate that woman mm. and free the woman from the oppression. Okay. You want me to say something, Mr. Shoshu? No. The, 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 there is a forum, there is a forum of, of first ladies in Africa, and, and I think uh, maybe our chairperson of the AU must also assist in terms of 
bringing in the issues of gender equality within all these forums that we find in, in, in the Africa, in the, our region, so that we are able to actually talk about some of these things and what they fuel. Just think about women in Zimbabwe. Uh, we have actually heard her saying that. What is going to be their reaction? Mm. What is going to be their defense in court? Mm. So those are, that's the narrative that I spoke about earlier on, to say we must also be able to change our narrative so that we are able to educate one another. Okay. Toko is on t uh, table number seven. Toko, table number seven. Sorry? Okay. <laughs> Morning, Minister. Morning, Chairperson. My name is Togon Pumluana from the CGE. My concern is young people, young girls. In a cultural context, we have a discourse going around on whether to inspect young girls or not to inspect young girls. Also, we have emerging issues of female genital mutilation in the country. And uh, the question is, how can we assist traditional communities to see that we also have a constitution that protects girl children. Thank you. Okay, and that is an important one because women have to be virgins when they get married, but men don't have to be. I mean, exactly. this is the yeah. kind of thing that I don't quite understand. And then there's okutwala and all sorts of practices carrying on. How do we manage this? You know, some of these practices, if you look at our laws, our laws do protect that. It's about the behavior. How do we change? How do we make sure that we change that? Because if you talk about the issue of um, uh, testing, in fact, my, my, my concern is that it's growing in South Africa. You know, I come from the township. I come from Soweto. I think most of us today know that many young girls in the township uh, now are going through that process. Whilst one might say it's good because it protects, uh, it's about abstinence and all that, I think we've got to address these th issues holistically because where we are now, the environment is different. Uh, if you look at a, ch a girl child who is active in sports, without sleeping with a man, a human gets because of you know aerobics whilst they want to look good and all that so some of those it's about awareness it's about campaigns making sure that there's an understanding of the broader context because how do you start uh, blacklisting a child who is innocent so we've got to do education and awareness and I think these are some of the issues which we have to engage in our communities to say how do we make sure that every child is accepted? Young kids of 10 are being raped, and some are raped by their own relatives, their own uncles. Then the child is sent to an aunt who's their wife to the uncle. And the aunt goes there and blacklists the child. Meanwhile, her husband right. is the culprit. So it's, it's issues which you have to raise, deal with them, and make sure that we change the attitudes and understanding of our people. And the issue of Ugutwala. For me, Ugutwala, it happens in South Africa, but it's wrong because we've got laws which don't allow Ugutwala. Kidnapping is kidnapping. If I get kidnapped tomorrow, no matter how old am I, I've got the right to open a case. So it's another area of educating our people. And we've got now a precedent where in Cape Town, uh, the man who toilet mm. was sentenced to 18 years mm. and protected tried to appeal the appeal court endorsed the sentence so let ourselves as the communities be able to educate our people to understand that there are laws which are protecting them and make sure that people get protected or women get protected but if we're going to sit back and say ah ugutwala Meanwhile, the law and the constitution protects us. It will be a problem. We have a responsibility of advocacy, educating our people about the recourse they have in law. All right, so we're gonna take another break, but I do need to get some answers now. What do we need to do practically uh, to, to save people? Um, as I said, the question I asked earlier, I hear somebody being abused next door. What do I do? How do we address this? Because it's happening right now. Somebody that you work with is abusing his wife, his yeah. girlfriend, and he shows off about it. What do we do? What do we say to him? 
how do we stop not getting involved? Because it just seems to be a lethargy, and I want to know what that is about. What do we do when we see it happening? I hope to get answers from you after this break.